Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the first session of the Smart Machines Workshop. Today, we will be covering the smart tools Rockwell Automation offers to help you on your smart machine journey. If you have any questions along the way, please feel free to enter them into the chat, and we will do our best to answer them. Over the years, we have seen a huge evolution in technology. In the bottom left corner, we can see the evolution of the phone, where we started with what I would refer to as a brick phone, and now we carry a phone with the same capabilities as a computer in our pocket. As for the internet, we have gone from no internet to slow internet to high-speed internet within 30 years. Could you imagine trying to stream Netflix in 2002? It would probably take you a day to watch one movie. So hopefully plant floor workers aren't watching Netflix while on their shift. So what do these technology improvements mean for the factory floor? With augmented reality, you are able to visually break down complex tasks into steps so that a new operator can easily follow and understand. This reduces the learning curve as well as mistakes. It allows standard operating procedures to be taken and put into a visual format. Instead of explaining how something should look and be done, we are able to show them. Artificial intelligence is being applied to systems to help determine how a system can be adjusted based on real-time data and learning algorithms. By collecting and analyzing data, decisions are able to be made quickly on things which are impacting the key performance indicators. Smart sensors provide additional information back to a system to allow for early notification of required cleaning, if a device is disconnected, or if incorrect devices are attached. With a connected enterprise, suppliers and customers are interconnected. So what is a smart machine? A smart machine is integrated with the devices on the system providing control and status. A smart machine provides real-time data of the operating system so that the data can be analyzed and enable you to make informed decisions. Having analytics on the machine provide predictive and preventative maintenance. With this, you can have scheduled maintenance and reduced downtime. With the Internet of Things, information that is collected from the plant floor is being contextualized and presented to the corporate network in the form of dashboards. Those dashboards then enable management to make informed decisions such as, do we have the capacity to make more? Are we able to take additional orders and deliver on time? Which plant has what capacity? And do we have enough raw materials? In this image, we can see we have a 5480 compact objects in a DLR network where it's connected to several devices. The PLC is also connected to another network where it's connected to Factory Talk Asset Center and Factory Talk VUSC. This is possible with the dual IP features of the PLC. On the computer side of the PLC, we have Windows 10 running along with some other applications. All that data we are collecting is now being pushed up to the corporate network where we have SAP and Windows Azure. Information from the floor devices provides insight to any maintenance that may need to be done. If a device was replaced and if it's an incorrect device, if the connection of a sensor was lost, predictive information showing if something is going to fail, prescriptive information for what should be done and how to address the problem. So why build a smart machine? What are the key business drivers for OEMs? Simplified integration allows machines to get out the door faster. They enable customers to make quick and easy decisions based off of the information provided. Enhanced security, making sure that only select people can access the machine. Predictive maintenance so customers are aware what failures could potentially happen and to perform maintenance. Adaptive machines and re new revenue streams. Smart machines add value, reduce costs, open up new revenue streams, and reduce risk. End users are looking for machines with lower downtime so they are able to produce more. By providing key point indicators, we can provide insight into how much is being produced and how much is being wasted and so on. Some of the key indicators that impact end users are revenue, profitability, working capital, and asset utilization. There are many digital tools for addressing challenges. Challenges faced by end users are typically throughput and flexibility limitations with current conveyance, high product mix causing numerous setup changes causing lost production time, mass customization, inventory pressure, newer complicated packaging requiring intermittent and continuous motion, high energy costs because of the pneumatics and electric, and plant floor space constraints. And challenges for OEMs are time to market for new machine designs, competition, and price. So what technology can you use to elevate the value you provide? One is using scalable edge computing. So doing analysis right at the machine, 
Two, would be taking advantage of scalable analytics. Three, serving the millennial operator. So having that mobile capability where they can pull something up on a tablet or their phone while they're moving around the plant. Four would be employing connections to modern open networks such as Ethernet and OPC UA. Five is flexible manufacturing, empowering your smart machines. Six would be leveraging digital thread technology. Seven would be embracing artificial intelligence. Eight is uh, scaling your offering to the changing needs of your customer. And nine is doing all of the above without staying up at night. Here we have scalable analytics. So starting at the bottom, we have factory talk analytics for devices, which is going to show us the status of the machine and some logs. When we move to Logix AI, we have the capability to look at specific application pieces and create a model. But then based on that model, we can decide if the machine is operating in its norm. With Edge Analytics, you're able to analyze right at the machine. Data View then allows you to create dashboards to display the real-time data so you can easily make decisions based off of what's happening. When we move up to the enterprise level, there is Dataflow, which is a machine learning, and then there's ThingWorks and Analytics, where you can show the dashboard. You can see how the machine is running up at the corporate level and do comparisons across the plant, where you can compare the performance of several different machines. More and more people are asking for a mobile way to access their systems. They want to have flexibility and not be tied to a specific point of the machine. So Thin Manager allows you to take content from a camera, a panel view, an operator interface, a SCADA system, and deliver out to devices, users, locations, or all three. You can deliver specific content to a maintenance person based off of their location in the plan. You are able to provide the content they need when they need it. A lot of older networks such as DeviceNet, ControlNet, Modbus are being replaced with OPC UA and Ethernet IP and making sure there's some resiliency. On this slide, you'll see an example of Parallel Redundancy Protocol, also referred to as PRP for short. This allows you to take one module in a controller and route it down to two separate networks at the same time. If there is a failure along one of those lines, the second path will transmit the information. If both networks are working fine with no problems, the end device does receive the information twice, but takes the one it receives first and processes the information and then disregards the second copy. On the communication side, there is Factory Talk Links and Factory Talk Links OPC UA to communicate to third-party devices. Factory Talk Services is the backbone of all of this. There's Operations Suite is the communications for the SCADA system or operator interface, and then you would use Factory Talk Gateway to communicate to a third-party SCADA system. So next we have independent cart technology and what this means for end users and OEMs. So end users are looking for faster, more flexible production. With independent cart technology, they will see increased production rates through reduced changeover time, increased process speeds, reduced town downtime for changeovers, so inventory reduction, shorter runs, and smaller warehouse, and a production schedule flexibility. Reduced machine footprint, so reduction in the infrastructure necessary to support production goals. Uptime, so reliability, reduced maintenance and spares, and reduced energy costs. For the OEMs, they're looking for market-leading machine performance and flexibility, so increased machine value and differentiated machine design, adds capabilities not possible with independent movers, and unlimited flexibility for diverse formats. So for digital thread and uh, digital engineering, we're just going to cover the historic workflow and then the digital engineering workflow. So the traditional workflow is design, machining the system, then commissioning. With the digital engineering workflow, it enables you to complete tasks in tandem. So for example, you were able to plan in a digital format and look and see if you need to adjust anything. This can help with finding bottlenecks or if speed needs to be adjusted. You're able to do controls testing virtually before the physical machine is built. But with digital engineering, what you're able to do is you're able from the passing around various drawings and concepts from team to team, you can connect electrical CAD packages and PLC software to share project data. From the testing mechanical elements and controls together when the machine is built, you can continuously test controls and mechanics together before physically building anything. For the run test product over and over again to test your design, you can model uh, your product and software to see how it will be affected when actually in production. And then instead of traveling to site ahead of production to train operators, you can train anyone anywhere in the world as soon as the design is finalized.
So there's also the Micro 800 with the simulator capabilities. So with this, there's three methods to simulate I.O. with a controller graphic, virtual I.O. wiring, or external program. And then the takeaways from digital thread digital engineering technology is the throughput analysis. So to optimize throughput design with simulation of dynamic processes, virtual commissioning, so testing, verifying, and commissioning control systems before they go into service, operator training, so reducing that risk by training workforce in a safe virtual environment, and machine prototyping, so you're able to design and validate next generation machines with mathematical models. So OEMs typically have a lot of people, uh, customers that they work with who are using micro 800s, compact logics, or control logics. And people want to be able to take what they have created and transfer it to another application easily. So the ladder logic that they've created in a Studio 5000, they may want to be able to share that ladder logic between Connected Components Workbench Studio 5000 and RSLogix 500, and they're able to do that by copying and pasting the ladder logic between those applications. Next up is um, embracing artificial intelligence. So with Logix AI, you can install the module in your chassis and have it look at specific I.O. points, which you want to be a part of your model. It will then analyze those inputs and determine which ones do have an impact on the output side and create a model. So once this is done, you'll train it again and make sure that that model is consistent with the normal operation. And then you can then implement this in the machine and have flags set for when your machine operates out of the norm. So smarter machines through digital and flexible manufacturing. So with Emulate 3D, you can create a digital 3D model of your machine where you can then simulate within Emulate 3D or connect to your Logix controller to simulate your machine. You can also take your CAD drawings into Emulate 3D to make uh, modifications and then push it back to your CAD drawing. This allows you to check certain behaviors and functions prior to the machine being in place. And to better showcase this product, I'm just going to play a quick video. And again, if you guys have any questions along the way, please feel free to enter them into the chat and we will do our best to answer them. My name is Derek O'Donnell. I'm a technical consultant with Rockwell Automation. I typically work with customers on applications and usually on applications that involve motion control or robotics or our independent cart technologies like iTrack. And today I wanted to show you just kind of a practical demonstration of how I use Emulate 3D to help me in some of my projects. And uh, most likely some of you, this would be the kind of thing that you would do with uh, Emulate 3D as well. But before I get into my application, let me just say that Emulate 3D has a lot of capabilities beyond this even. And uh, it can be used, and oftentimes it is used, for simulating how a line, an entire line, is going to work in a factory or a section of a factory or even an entire factory. If you go to Emulate 3D's website, you'll see models that are gigantic that show the whole flow through a factory. And I think they're used a lot of times for that just to determine how a product's gonna flow, where the bottlenecks are gonna be, what's gonna happen if a line's down and things like that. Um, but like I said, when I'm using it, I'm usually working on an individual machine, maybe with an OEM type of a customer. And so that we're, we're really more interested in testing out our controls. And uh, that's what I'm gonna show you today. So the typical project plan is like this one shown here. There's going to be a design phase, then it's going to get, the machine's going to get built, and then uh, there'll be a commissioning and testing phase before it gets shipped or handed over to the final customer. The reality is that it's very easy for the phases of the project to uh, extend longer than was originally planned, and basically that just keeps pushing the controls testing further and further back until you know, in many times the control testing might not even get started till right when the machine is supposed to be already running. But with Emulate 3D, what we can do is move that controls testing phase up quite a bit. Um, here we show it kind of happening right along with the manufacturing and the commissioning. But the reality is, and we'll show you some other uh, ideas later, but the reality is it, it could even be up in the design phase or even before the design phase. It can be kind of in the proposal phase. So here's the Emulate 3D model. It's a simple model meant to demonstrate some sample code 
but it, it'll be a good example to show some of the things we can do with it. So the machine is a, a pick and place system using a three axis Delta robot. The robot will pick up these red pucks from this conveyor over here and place them onto trays that are on this conveyor over here. The conveyors are connected to this conveyor axes inside my PLC program. So as I move those in my program, you'll see them actually move here and the pucks will move along. And also, if you see this red line right here that this puck is already blocking, that's actually a, a photo eye. And so when the puck blocks that photo eye, I'll get feedback into my uh, PLC program like I would from a normal input. I also have this, this little area here with these uh, colored lines, that's a simulated vision system. So when I trigger the vision system, if there's any pucks in that field of view, then it'll send me the information like the location and the rotation of the pucks, just like a real vision system was. So I can test my, pro my software there as well, as far as interpreting the data and tracking the parts properly. The trays also have a photo cell over here so they can be detected and tracked so the robot knows where to place the pucks. I used flat trays just because it was easier in the sample code to have a simple pattern where we'll place two pucks per tray, um, but and also use flat trays so that you can clearly see the pucks easily and to make sure they're in the right positions but you know, most applications would probably use something like some kind of case or a box and that could be done as well. So all of those things I just described are really things that are built into Emulate 3D. So they're very easy to, to drop into a model and get them connected to your PLC and working. But one of the challenges with a system like this is the robot itself. You know, usually one of the very first things that you would do uh, upon power up of a machine like this would be to verify that you had the robot set up right, the kinematics were working right, the coordinate systems and the axes were in the right directions and lined up properly. And so in this case, in order to make sure that was correct, what we did, rather than use one of the built-in Emulate 3D robots, which Emulate 3D has a lot of different robots, Delta robots like this, all kinds of different robots. But in this case, we contacted the manufacturer of the robot and they were able to send us a SOLIDWORKS model of the actual robot that we would be using here. And so then we were able to just take that SOLIDWORKS model and import it in and Emulate 3D lets us basically add to it various physical aspects of how the mechanism would behave. So for example, this thick, uh, thick black bar right here, it's actually connected to the servo motor and it would rotate about this point here. And this uh, linkage arm here would, is connected with ball joints at the top and the bottom to a little tooling plate and so on. So we can just specify those uh, physical attributes and then Emulate 3D will do the physics so that as we move our, our motor around like we would on the real robot, we can observe what will happen to the tool and make sure that our, our kinematics and everything are set up right. So we have a combination of some things that are just built into Emulate 3D and some things that we brought in via CAD to be more precise. So let's go ahead and run the machine and see the kind of things we can do with it. So the first thing I might do is, like I mentioned, is just verify that the robot is set up properly. Uh, typically that's going to be the first thing I would do once we got the real machine powered up. So I can come over here to the robot screen and I want my X axis to be parallel to the conveyors and with the positive beam down to the right. So I can just jog and I can see that, yeah, it looks like it's following. X or Y would be perpendicular to the conveyors. And Z would be straight up and straight down. So this is already set up, but you can see that that's, that's pretty valuable. If you've ever set up a machine like that, that's usually the first thing you're doing and you can easily run into problems, especially with the directions that X are and Y and things like that. So this would make sure that was all uh, test it out beforehand. So let's go ahead and run the process. So I'll just start it and we'll start letting pucks and trays come along. The pucks are somewhat randomly to the left and right. They're not all down the center of the conveyor and they're also randomly oriented. So the vision system is uh, measuring the parts and sending it to my PLC, which is tracking them properly. The trays are being tracked properly. And I can see that the robot is placing them on the trays, the pucks on the trays with the proper orientation, that repeating pattern there. 
So that kind of shows that the, you know, the controls themselves are working. But what about other things that we might be able to do? Well, we might be able to play a little more with the process, which even once you have your controls running, sometimes, and you have your machine set up, sometimes it's kind of hard to play with the process because, you know, how do you load all these parts? How do you load all these trays and keep running them back and forth and all that kind of stuff? So here we can do all kinds of stuff with these, with these items. I'll just do something really simple. I'll slow down the pucks and we'll see, we'll start kind of starving the robot for pucks and see how the program behaves. And in this case, what we'll see is, well, when we starve the robot for pucks, the system just kind of lets half full trays uh, go through. Well, that, that may be completely unacceptable. So maybe we discover that, hey, we need to do some work on the controls program here. We need to have the trays slow down or stop in that situation. If the tray is getting to a certain point and it doesn't have a fully loaded you know, pucks, Maybe it needs to stop. So that's the kind of thing we can do here. Now these trays and pucks are coming out on a time base, so, but we could do things like you can actually generate a spreadsheet with a specific pattern. Maybe there's a specific pattern of products that you know is problematic and you wanna make sure that it works with that. Or maybe you wanna always uh, run the exact same uh, pattern at the machine. So as you do changes to your program, you can see how it reacts to the same scenario every time. Let me speed this back up. Now when I speed up, I might actually have too many pucks and let a puck go through. Now it doesn't look like it's going to happen, but it, but that could happen. That might be another thing that you would want to uh, you know, do something about in your program. So what about other things? You know, that's, that's, that's the kind of the controls testing and then maybe you're testing the process. But what about things like training? So, you know, I've got the actual HMI here. I've got the actual machine here. So I could start and stop the machine. Maybe I can come over here to the recipe screen and train operators or train maintenance people that, okay, you know, what do these different things do? So maybe I'll change tray A position rotation to zero. And you can see here that that first puck is now rotated differently. You know, I can change speeds, angles. I mean, this is, again, a simple example, but you can see how you could train people to do all that kind of stuff. You might be able to do other things like train them on troubleshooting. So for example, I could grab this camera and just move it, you know, without changing anything in the program or without changing any parameters. And what you'd see is my robot would start, start missing the parts because really the robot needs to know where that camera is in relative to itself. So you would, you could create scenarios, you know, maybe your service department knows Here's the big hitters. Here's what usually we get calls on, you know, and, and you can make those things happen and show the operators what, you know, how it's going to look, how to identify it and how to go about fixing it. Um, again, you could do dimension lines so we could maybe move this camera, mess things up and then, you know, measure, okay, how far is it from the, from the robot to the camera and then enter that number into the appropriate uh, place in the program and, you know, be back in business, that kind of thing. It would also be useful maybe for your service department and your design department for things like, okay, if you wanted to make a change to the program, you know, you can definitely come in here and, and make sure you had it all ironed out ahead of time before you, you know, send it out into the field and, and put it in. Um, also, maybe if you were having bugs out in the field, you know how that goes where there's kind of a something that doesn't happen very often. Well, you know, you might be able to simulate that bug back at the office, get it to reproduce on your model, fix it, really test it. And then when that way, when you send out a fix out into the field, you know, you're very confident now that it's going to work versus, you know, you, we all know sometimes it happens where you send out a fix and, you know, that didn't fix it. And you might do two or three iterations of that before you hit on it. So hopefully that gives you some good ideas of the kind of things you might be able to do with Emulate 3D as far as uh, starting up your machine, testing out your control software before the machine's fully built, and maybe supporting the machine out in the field, and training operators and things like that. But there's also things you could do it even earlier than that in the design phase. For example, there's add-ins that you can add into SolidWorks or Inventor or even MATLAB or Creo. And so you could actually, during the design phase, have the mechanical engineers and the electrical engineers passing information back and forth and testing out concepts, not just have a 
a concept that you're just visualizing in your mind. I mean, you can actually try out the machine, try out some different options. Even before the design phase, you might be able to do a mock-up of a machine and be able to show your customer the, you know, your proposal and actually show it working and even be able to do things like do studies. Uh, is one machine going to be able to handle the throughput or do I need two or three machines? You know, things like that. But even this is probably just scratching the surface of what's possible. So if you're interested in exploring further or digging into some of the details, then just let us know. Thanks. Another great tool that Rockwell has is Application Code Manager. So this enables more efficient project development by leveraging highly reusable libraries. So you can create your own library using Library Designer or use provided ones. You can create not only logics, but also associated Factory Talk View, SE, ME displays, Factory Talk historian tags, and Factory Talk alarm and events content. So in summary, Application Code Manager helps you design faster and be consistent in your code. So here's just a quick demo on that product. Application Code Manager consists of multiple components, Library Designer, Library Object Manager, Application Code Manager itself, and Command Line Utility. Library Designer is a plugin to Studio 5000 to help the user create their library of reusable code called Library Objects. These Library Objects are templates for Logix Code, Factory Talk View, SE and ME screens and factory talk alarm and events as well as historian tags. These are organized with the library object manager. Rockwell Automation provides hundreds of commercial off-the-shelf libraries with application code manager and are available to download from the product compatibility and download center. Application Code Manager enables the user to rapidly develop an application using off-the-shelf or custom code, and it enables them to reuse their intellectual property. Studio 5000 Application Code Manager allows for the bulk creation and management of code elements in the Studio 5000 design environment, driving standardization and modularization of your projects across your organization. This means your projects are consistent, rapidly created, and more supportable. Users can leverage libraries provided by Rockwell Automation, such as our Plant PAX process libraries or our machine builder library access standardized objects for their use users can similarly create and save and manage their own library of created objects to be reused across their organization with libraries in place Users and teams rapidly create projects with their common components to jumpstart their project and take the time out of the design portion of the project. With commonality across their organization, there's no more variation from project to project or user to user. This means there's agreed upon methods of writing code and therefore less opportunity for human error. This standardization also means that the user who is asked to support various machines or programs know exactly how the modular pieces work and therefore can service those machines more effectively rather than deciphering how various users have written various machine programs. 
Library Designer enables users or a librarian to publish to a database. Then consumers can publish from the database. You can download library objects from the Product Compatibility and Download Center and register them or create your own existing code. Users can take their code and turn them into library objects. Or users can couple their own libraries with Rockwell Automation Libraries. You can add configuration parameters. Objects within Application Code Manager are embedded with configuration parameters that allow you to specify all the pertinent information on how the modular object is to be used in a project versus programming it. A single library object can contain aspects of logics, visualization, factory talk alarm and events, and historium. There are six basic steps within Application Code Manager. One, create the content you want to build a library object for. Take a motor, for example, write the motor control logic in Logics Designer, create the view display in Factory Talk View, plan out your Factory Talk alarm and events, and what tags you want to be in Historian. Two, use the library designer in library object manager to group and parameterize the contents into a library object manage all the library objects across all acd files and repositories for the library object manager three publish the library to application code manager so that it can be used in an application code manager project. This makes the library object available under the registered libraries and hosts the library in application code manager database. Now as a user, the libraries allow for rapid application development by leveraging library content provided or custom and facilitates the reuse of intellectual property which enforces standards. Implementation becomes very consistent across projects. Auto content generation helps build content for Logics Designer, Factory Talk View, Factory Talk Eleven Events and Factory Talk Historian. This creates your logic code and can leverage the power of Excel to turn one valve configuration into a thousand valves. This is spawned from a tool we use internally to execute projects. Four, create an application code manager project and add a controller. Five, select a controller and add the library object. Select the configuration of that motor based on the parameter you gave the library object in step two. You can then export that controller to Excel, replicate and modify as needed, then import back into application code manager. And finally six, we, when complete, you can generate the logic designer project. This will provide you with the ACD file with all the logic defined by your library objects available with application code manager. We've got free libraries from the product compatibility and download center. Application code libraries include Machine Builder Libraries, 
These libraries target different automation disciplines, such as motion, drives, and process. Library examples include Logic's controller programs and components, visualization displays and faceplates. This provides controller-ready logic and visualization tools for the design engineer. Just a few examples of machine builder libraries are packaging, process skid, web control, eye track, robotics, and the library of process objects. These libraries provide out of the box integration, which enables improved engineering efficiencies, consistent project format, predictability of system behavior, and has Rockwell Tech Connect support. We also have a no charge light edition now available, no subscription required, library designer included for creating custom libraries, ability to use libraries provided by Rockwell Automation, but is limited to a single controller and local database. The standard edition is now available at a low subscription and allows you to do multiple controllers. Thank you for your attendance. If you would like more information, please go to the following website. And the last topic we're going to be covering is um, security, so secure remote access with clarity, so bridging the cybersecurity gap between IT and OT. So here we have a typical way of doing security. We're having someone entered by SSH, RDP, VNC, or HTTP, HTTPS, and once they're in there, there are limited restrictions. But with Clarity, you can create user access and monitor what the user is doing. You can monitor while they are online and view real time what they're doing. So if someone is doing something they shouldn't, you can stop the session immediately. You have full control to view and watch and see and monitor. And you know, if you don't like what they're doing, if they're going to a place where they shouldn't be going, you can shut that down right away. So here's just a quick demo video on Clarity. This is going to be a quick demo of Clarity Secure Remote Access by Rock Automation. Uh, the first thing we can see here is a uh, SSL connection uh, to a, uh, in, in this case I'm logged in as the admin. So this is the admin console. Um, we'll be going back and forth with this, but we can see in this case on the dashboard tab, uh, any pending requests to, to servers or sites that, that we've uh, required uh, access or re requested access to where the uh, administrator has to approve that access. We can see any active sessions or any active VPN sessions, and we can see the servers that we've configured uh, to, uh, servers or end endpoints that we've allowed um, access to, um, and that we can restrict that access based upon the user. We'll, we'll show you that here in a second. Um, so the first thing I see here, but is a, um, uh, is this pending request. So let's take a look at um, what the end user um, is, in this case, David, I'm logged in as David. I can show you what I log out here for the login log out process. Uh, very simple access. So um, in this case, we're logged into a, a cloud uh, connection, but this would be um, your, uh, your local site, wherever your SRA server uh, uh, was set up, typically in a, in a virtual machine. Uh, but notice that the GUI is very simple and it was designed to be that way, right? So we have, um, this is the end user screen. In this case, similar to what we see in our admin screen behind this, but it's limited. So I've got a dashboard, I've got an application tunnel. If I wanted to download the VPN client software required, and I'll show you that right at the end, um, I would click that there. And then any files I chose to uh, give access to. In this case, I created an engineering repository for a folder 
and a short folder access um, that 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 uh, in this case was created by another user, John, that I allowed to create access to um, to share files in a secure secure fashion. Going back to this dashboard um, session, we can see that here I've got three servers that I can access. The original configuration, we had four servers over here. We'll take a look at that again. So we've we've restricted access to only those sites or end nodes that we want to uh, allow David to get access to. And then two of those he can directly connect up. This third one is, is this pending request and I already requested that um, that session. So if I want to go back over to uh, this uh, area here on the admin console, I'm going to prove this um, and I go back to the David screen and refresh here, come back into my dashboard. I've approved that session so now uh, David can connect up to that um, in this case the engineering workstation. So he's connecting up to this engineering workstation and maybe making some, some, some changes here. Um, all of these sessions are being recorded. So in addition to the over the shoulder view, so here I can actually see that there's an active session and a web session. I can open this up and take a look at that and um, to, to show that off if I actually, I'll move this over to a different screen, but I'll I'll minimize some different um, screens. We can truly see that that we are looking over the shoulder and monitoring what uh, what David is actually doing in the system. And so, you know, if we see that David is going doing something that he should not be doing, um, you know, maybe going to check out the, the latest news. Um, if that uh, EndNode has access to the internet, which which we probably shouldn't allow that. Um, anyway, we're going to disconnect his session. Um, so uh, this is not, you know, whatever message we want to to provide uh, back to David. So now we've just killed that active session. So you have total control of of who is active the system. We can also back go back and see, hey, what other sessions have been uh, allowed. So if you allowed access to uh, users during a given interval to a given ser uh, server, and you want to take a look at what that person did. Each of those sessions are, are recorded. So we can take a look and, and record and take um, a peek of what that other person was doing, you know, in their, in their session to make sure that there was uh, nothing nefarious going on um, and uh, can validate. Now this one's a pretty boring session, uh, but you get the idea, right? The, all the sessions are, are recorded and you can change the quality um, of those sessions right now, uh, either in high, high def or uh, medium quality and obviously that's going to affect the file size. Uh, server management. So the server management is where we've con configured the servers that are accessible. If we take a look at one of these like this endpoint node, uh, notice that we can change the, um, uh, the, the IP address. There's the protocol being used, you know, the port. We're passing these credentials on. So we're not requiring the user to know any, any passwords other than the password that we've set them up, set up for them for the web-based access. So we, there's a there's a level of password uh, vaulting or uh, obfuscation there with with passwords. So those can also be, um, we can leave those blank to require passwords there. We can leverage SAML um, for authentication for multi-factor. Um, notice that there's also, this is a, a limitation where we can set up the servers that are, that are able to connect uh, and the time period that we want to allow and the number of current connections. Um, for that uh, for that end node. Uh, go back to server management. We'll take a look at another station here. These are really easy to set up. You know, all of these can be exported. Um, you know, uh, in, in XML. If we take a look at this XML file, and then re-import those to uh, make it quick, very easy to, you know, quickly set up a um, uh, my servers as required. So you can see the 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 Excel file. They're pretty simple to to modify, and then we can import that in the same function. If we take a look at the application tunnel, here we're restricting the access to, um, and in this case, I want to allow for a VPN connection uh, to there's There's an invite function once I get that set up. If I take a look at the client config, I've downloaded that client config, and I can set, put that up in a repository, send that via email. Um, that is the configuration, unique configuration uh, file that's going to be reflected in whatever I configured here. So you can restrict this 
down to different locations, a site. I can have a roll up of different sites and I have a central location where I'm managing that. Um, but uh, very restrictive on what I can do down to the, you know, the ports and protocol uh, being allowed and even down to the, you know, the subnets if I want to restrict it to down to a specific end node. And then who has access uh, to that, uh, that VPN configuration. So the VPN um, configuration is that uh, CONF file. Um, I'll show you that in a, in a second when we actually can load. If we load that up, um, it's actually going to load it up in our, in our VPN client. Uh, application tunnel that uh, that was downloaded uh, that I downloaded previously, uh, but this tunnel is also available um, again in the application. So this user and I'm logged in as David. We can see that application client download uh, tunnel option there. Um, and if I want to connect, now I've connected based upon that configuration. Um, I should see that connect here, and then my active sessions also show that VPN uh, configuration. So it's a, it's a single location. So not only for, you know, uh, easy, secure, uh, you know, web based remote access, but if I need to provide uh, access to a specific uh, software application that I can't host locally, um, I can allow for an application tunnel uh, coming through in that system. And sure enough, there's my application tunnel uh, on that. Uh, files, I mentioned this, I set up an engineering folder um, and, you know, here I've shared this uh, with this group called Kings, uh, and I'll show you that here in a second. Um, but it's a simple way to, you know, to, to, to easily share files um, and uh, without having to enable maybe USB uh, access uh, down on the, on the plan floor. User management, um, here I've got David and John, and these are both members of these two groups. So if I take a look at Kings, Kings is a, uh, David's a member of Kings, and if I take a look at uh, Princess, um, we've got uh, John as a member of, of that Princess group. So pretty simple right now. These are standalone, but these could all be uh, linked to domain-based users or groups as well. Um, and then um, my, my activities, what's going on in that, in that, in that area. Um, user management and, and sessions uh, is, is, again, going back to that server management. Here I can restrict this based upon the individual users. So here we've got princes and kings are both allowed um, that that uh, access to that that is specific asset. So that is SRA in a nutshell. Uh, it gives me the ability to control um, everything in that system, uh, be able to see what's going on, uh, be able to do an over the shoulder view and monitor active sessions. Uh, allows me to provide a, a simple remote access solution where the user just has to have a web browser to get access um, to that system and to that site um, and you know be able to quickly monitor and control what that person or, or persons are doing uh, in the system. So to summarize, the plan is typically that you spend this amount of time on design, then this amount on manufacturing, and then you do your commissioning and controls testing at um, the same time. And then the reality is that you actually spend more time on design, more time on manufacturing, and then you oversee that deadline in commissioning and controls testing. But with Rockwell's um, digital tools and following best practices, you're able to do your design, then your manufacturing and commissioning, and your controls testing throughout that manufacturing and commissioning time. I just want to say thank you for listening, and we will stay on a bit. So if you do have any questions, please feel free to enter them into the chat. And here's just a snapshot of the upcoming sessions. Thank you for joining us.